Hello, everyone. Welcome to our first episode of our podcast, Real AI Now, brought to you by Two Impulse. This is the first episode of 2024. Today, I'm very excited. We have a um, special format. Uh, the topic today is the very hot topic, large language models. We have with us uh, Mark Giambetti, who is also one of our podcast hosts. And we have Pascal Guldner. He is our specialist at Two Impulse in the topic of large language models. So welcome, Pascal. And let's start right away. What are large language models and what are they for? Well, hi, guys. Thank you. Um, it's very nice to be here. And yeah, to answer your question right away, basically, they're uh, very big neural nets that model uh, word uh, distributions um, uh, are according to uh, the linguistic regularities that we have in our languages. Okay. okay. Uh, so let me pick on, on your answer a bit. So there's at least two parts. Uh, neural nets, what is a neural net? And uh, let's get to the second topic afterwards. What is a neural net for, well, for our audience? Well, a neural net is a statistical um, method to that is uh, where you can show that it is able to approximate any function. Um, okay. I would emphasize the word approximate to approximate here um, mm -hmm. because uh, this uh, hints at the, I mean, statistical, it's obviously statistical. So um, we are always dealing with probabilities. Um, this is important when, um, um, because we have to keep in mind that the big shift that we're seeing with the use of machine learning everywhere is away from rule-based systems to statistical systems. Mm -hmm. And statistical systems, they can approximate distributions. Um, so right. we will never, we will never have a uh, hundred percent correct solutions, but we will, we can actually approach them by approximating them. Mm -hmm. All right. So some of our listeners and viewers are definitely familiar also with the the, the topic of machine learning, right? And uh, that, that sounds similar. What what are the differences between LLM and more classical machine learning? Because neural nets are also one of these machine learning methodologies. Well, I think one of the underlying techniques that actually uh, that made the the takeoff of LLMs possible that we're seeing today is the introduction of a training paradigm um, that is something in between the two classical supervised and unsupervised learning paradigms. It's somewhere in between. Some argue it is rather supervised learning. We call it uh, semi-supervised learning um, or self-supervised learning. And mm -hmm. um, in essence, it means that we can leverage uh, un unnotated data, data that has not been processed and labeled by humans, but instead we can just pick up that data in its raw form, essentially, mm -hmm. and this allows us to do this in very, very large quantities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and okay. this is, I think, the underlying difference, if you will, from machine learning. In essence, it's not different machine, the, the techniques are the same. We use a special type of neural network we use, in, in essence, it's stack transformers, but uh, this is just machine learning. Um, this is just a special type of architecture. Okay. Um, so mm -hmm. there is nothing really fundamentally new here in terms of architecture, um, but um, I would argue it, it in, mm -hmm. at the very bottom, it's self-supervised learning at scale. Okay. Mm -hmm. So... Um... I will try to kind of uh, introduce you a different, uh, like a slightly another perspective more for the business audience. So let's say if we split machine learning, the ability for machines to learn from data, 
or from uh, the ability for software to learn from data, computer to learn from data. Classically, you had two kinds, supervised and unsupervised. So let's start with the supervised. Supervised learning was or is something like you give machine examples. So let's say you want to train a system that is able to distinguish cats from dogs. So you essentially <clears throat> show the system pictures of cats, pictures of dogs. You label them. So these are cats. These are dogs. Mm -hmm. Then there is a statistical method that allows it to learn from these examples. And the system is able to classify and distinguish cats from dogs with a certain level of certainty. So it's an approximate model of... Um, and so this is supervised learning. Unsupervised learning would be for this particular exact particular case, you actually feed the system with pictures of cats and dogs, but you don't tell it which ones are the cats, which ones are the dogs. The system uses a statistical method to cluster the data and somehow understands that because they are similar, Cats are in a category, dogs are in the category. It doesn't know the names of the category, but it knows that there's two of them and is able to cluster them. So what you essentially said is that these transformers, the architecture that is behind the large language models, and I think we should get that, how this applies to language, what I just said, um, is a combination of both, right? It's one, the, 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 um, unsupervised part is the so-called encoder uh, part of the transformer and then the supervised part is the decoder i it's not very accurate but it's simply put it's something like this so a transformer is a combination of the two methods and this is what you are calling and what the community and the scientific community calls it semi supervised learning is this a more or less correct Description. Well, well um, I mean, the the training, to be clear, the training objective when training, no matter whether we're talking about the classical transformer architecture, which is a consists of encoder and decoder, or uh, either of those, a uh, bird style model and encoder, or what we're seeing today, mainly the decoder models, um, they're always trained in fashion where we can calculate the error between the true label and the output the the predicted label mm -hmm. right so right. this is um classical supervised learning yeah. on a mechanistic level but if you look at the data um it's not supervised learning anymore uh as in uh super having access to a, to a labeled data set where a human actually labeled something mm -hmm. Where I can see some um, some some overlap with with what supervised learning what can be done with with unsupervised learning is that uh, we create um, a latent space. Um, if we think that the encoder, if we have the classical architecture, the encoder basically projects the input into something that we call a latent space. Mm -hmm. It's a highly dimensional space uh, that is learned. And in this space, um, um, basically word embeddings, uh, vector representation of words, of uh, input mm -hmm. representations, they're part of this space. And you can actually identify clusters in this space. If we analyze those word embeddings, if we um, see what of those uh, vectors are close together, then we discover that we then we discover uh, uh, clusters, and those actually correspond to our um, to the meaning that we assign to those words or to the concepts um, mm -hmm. that um, that form basically those clusters concept conceptually. And um, so I can see some similarity with unsupervised learning or what you can do with it uh, here mm -hmm. here as well. Uh, and and yes, yeah. I. That's that's quite remarkable. That's that's that it really was remarkable for the community uh, when this, uh, yeah, when we started working with word embeddings in two thousand around two thousand 
11 13 actually uh was mm -hmm. where the big big mm -hmm. breakthrough was in that area yeah, what, so what was the, the... go so, ahead Mark. Sorry, sorry. no so so for the larger let's say the larger audience the larger public probably the uh let's say the birth of chat gpt was the moment they heard from large language models from from the first time this was really the application uh, where people understood well there is this thing like generative ai and it's very powerful and gives interesting results can you say a couple of words you, you said okay well it's not such a new topic can you a bit explain what happens where what were the steps which made us arrive to chat gpt and also what happened in the last in the last year roughly in the field of llms yeah i mean those are that's those are questions that uh, really keep the whole uh, feel totally on its feet and are still not quite digested. The takeoff of um, of LLMs basically with ChatGPT. Well, to be honest, ChatGPT itself, the underlying um, um, uh, algorithms, they're not new. Nothing is new. Mm -hmm. We've known all of this uh, for quite some time, actually. Um, but, uh, what, uh, the creators of, of chat GPT managed to pull off was, um, leveraging, um, um, uh, reinforcement learning with human feedback, feedback in a very effective way. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe, and at a scale that basically no one else has done before. Um, and I think those two combinations uh, human feedback, uh, uh, re reinforcement learning with human feedback and combining, uh, using that, applying that to a very big model, of course, uh, having all the necessary resources for that, um, which uh, makes, puts them in a quite unique spot. Um, um, that made JetGPT possible, this combination. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. to be clear, reinforcement learning human feedback really requires uh, a lot of human labor mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. uh yeah. to my knowledge i mean we have had uh, access to platforms leveraging human annotators for quite some time mm -hmm. um right mm -hmm. um and and uh um, but um that really um they really open ai really uh, uh pushed that quite far mm -hmm. and okay. and to their credit of course they use this this uh this algorithm the reinforcement learning uh really effectively mm -hmm. on chat gpt and i think that's what what made this so so efficient uh, so effective and so convincing so just to dig a little deeper uh, on, on one thing so on one side we said okay llms they don't need training data but to enable chat gpt we have um, also reinforcement learning with human feedback where there is a lot of annotation how do those two things fit together? Yeah, the um, the the training of uh, the the um, uh, the pre training we say well well we can, we basically we can structure the the training all that is learned by a language model in different mm -hmm. phases. Um, the first and most resource intensive phase, both in terms of data and hardware. Um, is the pre-training phase um, where we feed the model raw text, uh, more or less raw text. Mm -hmm. And uh, it has been processed, pre-processed to some extent, but those are very, very basic heuristics. In essence, what the model sees during that phase is raw text and predicts the next word. Um, there it picks up um, linguistic knowledge. It can actually model linguistic singularities uh, to an extent that um, could not be reproduced by any other NLP algorithm. Um, mm -hmm. And um, and uh, it picks up quite general knowledge that can be shown. And that was really, mm -hmm. uh, that was really a huge step forward that we could see that very much, uh, uh, um, very subtle human uh, uh, linguistic uh, regularities could could be captured that way, and that's one of the and and that's just the the first phase. Um, I mean, um, here, Pascal, I think you are we are coming back to a topic that 
I feel that we kind of jumped that you mentioned that is quite important and that, that, that the real breakthrough in processing automated processing of natural language is actually embeddings vector representations of language this is the real breakthrough that you were talking about that in this kind of um appeared in around 10 years ago maybe a little bit longer um 2011 2012 2013 and they have appeared and, earlier than that but yeah mm -hmm. sorry at, at least i don't know when bird came out the, the like the, the this model from google when, when they released mm -hmm. it i don't do remember exactly when but it was around that time Eight, 1819 bird was 1819 19 actually okay 19 okay later than uh but the, the precursors of BERT is that like there was this um, word to vec model when that, when, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. it was sort of a precursor of uh, one of the first um, embeddings, large embeddings model that came out. And this is, I, I'm mentioning this because um, natural language processing has been around for some time. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of work done in so-called feature engineering using, um, let's say, uh, using features of the grammar of and using the parts of speech um, kind of, you would analyze text and make representations of, of text based on features. And these features were kind of the structure and that changed, it became purely statistical. And, and that's the real breakthrough. So all of a sudden you start representing words as vectors that were purely statistical calculated and that contained some semantics, some meaning in them. So you could actually start using these algorithms and um, that were really good with vectors with language, right? And that's, and you could do that all of a sudden at a very large scale and using graphic cards like GPUs. So we had lots of data. You could represent words with as vectors. You could use um, graphic cards to process this data. All those together made this possible. Is is this would be this a, would be would this be a correct assessment? Yeah, I, I think this 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 captures the the important uh, ingredients. Is basically, um, um, I mean, so, we we've had. I would, I would, uh, to be precise, I mean, uh, for representing words or text or pieces of text and words uh, has always been a very active research area. And we have been representing words or pieces of words as vectors before, but those vectors were uh, completely of a different nature. They were, we say they were sparse because they mm -hmm. encoded uh, features that were exactly. handmade, that were thought of in advance and often uh, required it, linguistic it not, or expert knowledge to come up with. It was not with. purely statistical. There was some feature no. engineering, feature craft kind of work that was done by humans. Exactly. Um, we did apply statistics on those feature vectors. Yeah, right? but the features so were done by humans. Exactly, but the features yeah. were done by humans. Um, the pre, I would say the direct predecessors of word embeddings as we know them today um, are uh, count-based vectors, um, right? So uh, for words, they would be... Um, and grams. There would be... There would be one hot encodings basically so you'd have a vector that of the size of the vocabulary and you have the index of the word the fixed index of a certain okay. word would have a one and everything else would have a zero oh. um those were used um for documents we would encode uh, uh for every word for in, in the vocabulary we would uh, indicate at, at its corresponding position we would have the count of this word and the document would be represented by the count of each containing word. And uh, so those were count-based uh, methods. And we would those are vectors as well. But those vectors necessarily had the size of the whole vocabulary. So, and right. most of those uh, positions in, in such a vector would be zeros. And this is why we call them sparse. Very sparse, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so and, 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 and the change was... The big difference was that we could all of a sudden, not all of a sudden, but, but um, 
eventually we would with word to vec for example and the first method to do so uh, we would represent pieces of words or words in dense vectors those vectors w were way way lower uh way smaller had a very much much lower dimensionality mm -hmm. uh typically in the beginning they were in the hundreds um now they're larger but in the hundreds but not in the in the dozens of thousands like a vocabulary size mm -hmm. um and in particular, those vectors would capture statistics of the word with respect to all the contexts that this, this word has appeared on, has appeared in, um, uh, inspired. So, so they sort of represented meaning or semantics instead of. Yes, yes, exactly. The, inspired yeah. by, by the saying of the, the British linguist in the 50s, first, um, uh, you shall know a word by the company keeps. This has been the coining. Yeah, it, it, coining up of uh, uh, distributional semantics, and this is the underlying theory, basically, of why word embeddings work. Okay, right. So now, now what you said, uh, we were talking about ChatGPT. So now, this new way of representing words, and the fact that you could actually learn this, and then you could all of a sudden train these transformer models to kind of you, you to predict let's say the the next word in the sequence um so you you train these models with lots of text right with 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 large bodies of text coming all over from the internet so you train them in, you can then actually ask them to predict the next word and they become pretty good at doing that but they are very raw it means it means that all kinds of predictions could come. And now the breakthrough with ChatGPT is that OpenAI built an application on top of this very powerful model that um, that is actually user-friendly. And in order to do that, they use the technique on top called reinforcement learning with human feedback, right? And this, and that means in practice that it's not an autonomous reinforcement learning algorithm, like, I don't know, the robot that learns how to navigate in a room by hitting a wall, um, but rather something that actually requires human feedback to in the loop for it to learn, right? So now um, I, I'm asking a question now to Mark. Mark, how do you see that this changed things? And I, I mean, what is, you talked about the break, the breakthrough is obvious, but what do you see from your conversations with people mm -hmm. um, that that this changed? Yeah, this, this new method change. Yeah. So I think I mean the, the first thing which is really important is um, that people understood this distinction that ChatGPT is just um, let's say an example application of what you can do on this kind of, of models. What I think changed in the last uh, 18 months uh, with discussions I had with clients, with, with researchers, with developers, is really, I think people are thinking about a lot of use cases, how to apply that in their business processes. Um, that could be how to make your software development process smarter, how to help you draft better contracts, how to review um, submissions of documents. So really, um, thinking about um, generative aspects. So it's really kind of a bit of a pioneer time where people really think about wh what is possible. And I think now we're getting into the phase where um, it's also about applying these two particular use cases, right? So everybody tried out this chat GPT on the website, but now it's really how can I make use of that within my context of work? Isn't it, and so, it, that, isn't it so that at least what I've been uh, witnessing sort of mm -hmm. is that, let's say before ChatGPT, after ChatGPT, do it to to do natural language processing was a task that well you actually needed a data scientist to do that or at least an mm -hmm. NLP engineer to do that. Now with this kind of technology, is it is it not so that now you can give this test to a developer and all of a sudden you have a developer who is not necessarily trained in natural language processing or machine learning 
uh, using this kind of technology uh, successfully? Uh, I mean, yes, absolutely. So this is exactly one of the points which uh, which make uh, Alalam so so charming, right? So I give an example. So if before, let's say, um, GPT models, you wanted to extract information from documents, let's, for instance, assume in an insurance contract uh, yeah. or con uh, concept, you wanted to extract, I don't know, the date of loss and where that loss happened, then maybe the person who was involved. And imagine you would have had these documents in various languages, so like in English, in Spanish, in French, German, etc. You would have to have to sit down and do one extraction model per language, right? And really think, okay, what, uh, how do these words uh, reflect? What is, mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 let's say, the concept in this particular language? And you would have, with the data scientists or linguists, really sit down and do that per per case. Now, I think with um, the, the right prompting, which is the, let's say, the, the technical term for what you send to these models, right, as a, as a request, you can do that in one go. So you can not only just extract that information by saying, okay, you are an, an expert in that field, now please go and extract these particular informations from the document. Mm -hmm. But if your model has been, um, let's say, trained on various languages and know that a claim is a Schaden in German and a Sinistre in French. You can do that in one go with your model and um, a developer is able to write that prompt and to make it even more charming, you can tell the model and now please give me back the result in a JSON format, which I can immediately process in my application, parse it, so machine can easily, it's a machine readable answer and then you just process it and continue your workflow. And I think that is really um, something so, which which changed. So, so in other words, it, it's kind of democratizing the access to this kind of uh, well, the, the, the technology. And um, so, uh, trying to to summarize what you said, let's say you want to extract information from a document, like uh, I don't know, address, name, address, telephone mm -hmm. number. Uh, and some date, uh, some date of loss in the insurance. Sure. Yeah. Now, before you actually had to train, uh, had to sit down and and train a specific model to do that, and we fit it with a lot of examples. And then, if you had enough exactly. and good data, you could train a model that could do that successfully, or at least with a high level of accuracy. Yeah. Now you can do that without training. At least without this kind of investment, you you can use other techniques. Um, yeah. You can use the pre-trained large language model mm -hmm. to to do that job uh, much yeah. easier. Is that yeah. what you're saying? Exactly. So th th that's what I'm saying. So basically, you don't need to train that for the particular documents mm -hmm. you have. Very often, you also don't have that many documents available, so that a training even makes sense from that uh, statistical means. So. Uh, now, you, you don't have to have many documents. Actually, you don't have to have any documents at all, let's say, mm -hmm. in, the, in the first step. And I think that's a really big advantage, particularly mm -hmm. if your business has very, I don't know, niche kind of documents or a lot of kind of like document classes. All your documents kind of look all look different, but kind of contain the same information. In the mm -hmm. past, that would have been, let's say, uh, tricky, troublesome to do. You would have to spend a lot of uh, time in, let's say, engineering the categories, etc. Now you can um, cover a lot of these cases just by the right prompting and the, the disambiguation, which is basically happening in in the model. So that um, democratizing, yes. So it's making this much much more easier to build natural language applications for a broader called audience of of developers without particular linguistic linguistic skills, for instance. Okay. Yeah. I would so, say I would yeah. say this is true, uh, um, but I would emphasize that uh, the democratization or the effective democratization really hinges on having access to those models, um, mm -hmm. and uh, this is where um, quite uh, where a lot of this uh, of of the future of how we're going to be using those this technology will be decided on how open it's going to be carried out how open is the mm -hmm. uh, um, how mm -hmm. are companies going to see it in their interest of training uh, of doing investing uh, into the training of those models which is very very mm -hmm. 
uh, it's technically involved and in particular, it's really demanding on resources. Yeah. So how much uh, interest are companies, big companies that are in the spot to do that uh, uh, mm -hmm. going to have? Because this is really where it hinges on. Um, if um, right now I uh, the dynamics really look in, look favorable, um, mm -hmm. I really think uh, um, I'm expecting 24 to be the year of the open source models. If 23 okay. hasn't been already, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. So we are we are but transitioning to a new topic, uh, which I find yeah. very interesting. So, and I'd like us to. Stay a bit in this, right? Um, options that companies, organizations have on the table today. And how do we think about this? I think that this is quite important now. And bringing the aspect of um, your own data, right? So these models have general knowledge and, and uh, well, the company, their specific company knowledge and data. Now, so I see here two or three aspects. One is, should I go as a company for uh, open source or should I trust like vendors like Microsoft, uh, OpenAI, um, Google, et cetera? Or, uh, or so what is what are the advantages and disadvantages of both? And then when I want to actually use my data, uh, what are my options? What what should I do? Because there's there's more than one option. Or uh, so, uh, can we start from that? Should I mm -hmm. go for open source or should I go? Pascal, you already hinted on open source, but aren't, for example, the the best models the ones from OpenAI? Why should I go for a, an open source model that is not as good? Mm -hmm. Well, maybe I can pick, pick on that one. Um, so yeah. the open AI models, right? They are, they are great and they are, they are very powerful, yeah. but you also have to do your considerations. So for instance, privacy and data sovereignty, right? So in some regulated industries, it's not that easy to use these models, right? So that's kind of like the, the first uh, evaluation. The second one. So basically, or maybe in a regulated industry, you are not allowed to use these models. You are not allowed to share any data. On the other side is also like your own data. Do you have the possibility to enhance these models with, with your own data? And can you do that in your own data center or not? Right. Um, you mentioned in the beginning, it's like the biggest models or the best models, right? So these best models, they also come at a certain, certain price. The question is, do you always need the, the, the Rolls Royce or the Ferrari, or is there maybe a better model, right, for the particular job you have at hand, right? And then there are also considerations like uh, response times of these models, right? How, how quickly you get the results. Um, so imagine you need immediate feedback in your development environment, right? Because we are, you are coding and you want to have some uh, autocomplete or, um, a GitHub Copilot features, right? You need to have those results quickly in a couple of milliseconds, right? If you want to wait, uh, sorry, if you if you have to wait a longer time, it's it's not worth it, right? So like uh, your result comes in too late. So it's not just about the best model, the biggest model, but the right model for the right job. And I think um, with the emergence of a lot of open source models in different sizes. Also, there is more, let's say, uh, different options now you can you can choose from. And um, this plays really into, let's say, also addressing these issues that you can do, um, let's say, choose the right model, also take care of privacy and data sovereignty constraints and control your own data. That's like maybe the, the, very, the very high level thing I do see. Right, I mean, I... I think there are several dimensions to how people use mo very big models, state-of-the-art models like GPT-4, ChatGPT. Um, I think uh, one one is is being a convenience, uh, which comes from um, having a very big, technically very capable company like OpenAI or Microsoft. Um, Another one is obviously comes from the maybe fascination um, of um, uh, when when people discover what what it can do, right? That you can mm -hmm. confront it with a very wide range of 
of tasks like that you can interact with it seamlessly uh having coherent conversations about topics with very deep uh, where you can talk about things with very uh, with big depth and um um so this is one aspect or this is another dimension the fascination which extends into scientific communities as well of course and mm -hmm. um those aspects mm -hmm. are or the different dimensions of the capabilities are of course uh, uh also um a subject of 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 scientific investigations mm -hmm. uh but then if it comes to um if if we if if the if if um, business driven um um requirements come into play then maybe mm, much of what is so uh fascinating um needs to be looked at a little bit more um with a little more rigor for example do we need uh a model do we need to use a model that is capable what we want to do named entity recognition which is a classical task right mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. do we really need to use a model for that um that is able to um uh, give you a very detailed answer to how a certain algorithm works and how it is implemented in scala no, no we don't really so, uh, um <laughs> and um and this is something that you will eventually pay a price for as a business if, right because um because every company that runs such a big model we don't know exactly how big it is but we know it's very big and uh, it costs a lot of money to do that um it will uh, you will have to pay in some way for that and um there is uh and it is uh, the state of open source models is such that um if we take the right model which is typically much much smaller and uh we take a fine tuned version of it always uh and then we adapt it maybe i mean named entity recognition is maybe not a good example here because we would use an encoder for that and uh but mm -hmm. it's possible with decoders as well. Um, encoders would be much more efficient because you can use a really, really small one, like birds. Um, but virtually for any problem that is uh, that is reasonably well defined, uh, we will find a smaller model that, given a very small amount of data to fine tune it on, a mm -hmm. stage where we haven't talked about mm -hmm. it uh, in detail, uh, but right. what I was hinting at before. Um, if you have quite little data and you use that for adjusting basically the model, mm -hmm. um, then you will be able to achieve uh, results right. that are comparable to yeah. state-of-the-art yeah. uh, um, uh, decoder generative models for, like for, GPT-4. For for that particular task, right? So, yes. Um, right, and and this kind of brings me to the next topic. Um, now, if I wanna, if I'm a company, right? Then the typical typical case is, yeah, I have, um, I don't know how many sources of information. Let's say I have ten knowledge bases where I have information, either documents or articles, uh, wh whatever discussions for internal forum discussions, whatever. And now I want to find information in those places and I want to actually get answers from those data sources, right? From my data. Um, what are the options, right? What should I do um, as a company? And at least one thing was already mentioned, like fine tuning is, should I just take that data and fine tune my model to learn that data? Um, should I use another, um, another option like uh, RAG, Retrieval Augmented Generation? Is it a combination of two, of the two? And then these are thoughts that I'm having right now. And then, well, is it, should I use open source? Should I take a model that is good at Q&A only? Uh, don't, I don't need one of these gigantic models. Should I actually use 
the best in class, the largest model available from OpenAI. So what should I, what are the, the options here? Um, it, it's, um, it depends, it really very much depends on, on how, how, um, how much you can constrain your use case, I would say. Um, but, um, <clears throat> is it, is a certain domain, um, where are your documents coming from? What are, it, what are they talking about? What you want to do? What do you want to do on those documents? You want to do mm -hmm. Q&A? Um, For example. Then the RAG approach, which is um, uh, basically is, is the first thing that comes to mind. RAG is a technique that, um, that really exploits the natural capabilities of language models quite well. Because uh, mathematically, they um, they estimate um, a certain piece of text or a word given some previous text, right? And if we um, if we define this previous text to be uh, mm -hmm. a potential source of information, like a document where we know the answer uh, 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 that contains the answer. We um, we let uh, we basically we let uh, the 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 language model um, we condition the language model on this information, and then uh, add our question. Mm -hmm. Then we mm -hmm. we exploit the natural capabilities of actually extracting the information according that is asked for in the question out of the prefix that uh, which is the document. Okay, um, Mark. Uh, excuse me, Pascal. Yeah. Uh, Mark, what Pascal just said. If you, if we take this to insurance, mm -hmm. right? And how would this apply? Let's say I'm in an insurance environment yeah. and I'm <clears throat> trying to settle a claim. Um, yeah. So I need to look up information on, yeah. uh, on like how certain claims were handled in the past and. Mm -hmm. How does this Maybe apply? some guidelines, right? So how to handle Maybe claims? Some guidelines, exactly. How does this how does this apply? Yeah. So definitely, I think the first step would probably be the identification of these documents which are relevant in the context, like maybe some standards or some past claims, um, historic data, how certain things were handled, right? Maybe some vocabulary, some uh, some some border cases. So basically, mm -hmm. everything you have you can get hold of, which is relevant for the particular problem you want to solve. I think that would be an important starting point. Then exactly doing kind of like the um, let's say the the um, storing those these documents in so called a vector database, right? Which then, at, as the name says, retrieval augmented generation. So at retrieval is in layman's term being combined with the result from the LLM, really provides then not just a generic answer which mm -hmm. comes out of the LLM based on the data that has been trained, but it's basically your LLM plus your own data, and it allows you to understand this context. What is the advantage of this also in practical terms, uh, I think, is that if you think of, of, of fine-tuning a model, right, that comes with mm -hmm. a lot of effort, and every time your data changes, uh, you have to redo that, right? In a fast-paced environment, right, where there are new documents created daily, or or uh, or even I don't know, even more, right? You need to change this data. Maybe some data becomes irrelevant, right? You want to remove or add some, and it's much much easier to just mm -hmm. keep up to date your representations in a vector database than so, having to re-update your model. So, so it's also practically easier. So essentially, what you're saying is that. Well, you cannot get away from having a sort of a, a vector representation of your data um, parallel to your model because keeping such a model up to date is not practical. But you can actually exactly. keep a vector database up to date with daily or even hourly updates. Updates, yeah. Um, pretty much like a search engine or something like that. And correct, yeah. And actually. Bringing the two together is a pretty good approach. Do you, do yeah. you agree with this, Pascal? Do you think that 
it is more practical. I can imagine that training, retraining, or even fine tuning every day such a model would be probably very expensive and not practical, or at least not every hour if you need the data to the hour. Or no, not at all. That'd be actually quite expensive, and the added value. It's not clear what the added value would mm -hmm. be in the end. Uh, no. RAG is interesting. Indexing documents like this is interesting. Mm -hmm. um, it's in particular, it's interesting because you can, um, because mm -hmm. in the end, you can actually attribute the answers to something. Right. Ne right. Not necessarily, but if this is a requirement, uh, you, then can. you can actually, uh, you can actually implement and, that requirement. And it's actually the only way you yeah. can do it, right? Because you can't, you can attribute an answer if you, Let's say scenario A, you have all your data and you fine tune your model with that data only, and you only do that. You can get an answer, but you cannot attribute the answer. You don't even know if the answer is true or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Please correct but me if I'm saying something stupid. But if you if you use a retrieval augmented generation, uh, in other words, a mixture of a vector database with a large language model, you look up the information in the vector database, you use the large language model to generate an answer based on those results and based on some other parts of the prompt, then you can actually generate the answer and say, okay, I found this answer here. Um, and, and you can actually um, uh, refer to the source. And this is the only way nowadays that, that you can do that is with this rock approach. Um, th that that is that is true. But to pour some water in the wine, um, what the effectiveness of this approach usually hinges on is um, is the retrieval of the relevant document, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. uh, we have pretty sophisticated ways of encoding documents in, in that vector space, mm -hmm. um, but um, the retrieval mostly boils down to something as trivial as uh, calculating the cosine similarity between the question and the document, mm -hmm. and that is uh, that's a that's a very very active research area and has been for some time, but um, um, it is not much much more sophisticated than that, and uh, and and there is. I think this is the most, uh, this is the biggest source of errors here. And uh, there's still lots of experimentation that you will have to do in order to make this effective um, at, um, for okay. your use case. So, so what you're saying is that <clears throat> you can have, what what I interpret from that, uh, and please Mark, I'm interested in your yeah. thoughts about this, but uh, what I interpret from that is that you can have, all the nice models you have, you can have the best large language model in the world. Um, but if you don't do the the retrieval part right, and so um, process the data correctly so that it's um, that, and you don't have the good data, um, in the end, the solution will not work. Because if the retrieval is not good, then the, the answer you'll get is also not good. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. So this is, uh, I mean, I was recently having a discussion also with the person we discussed about, okay, when can you really use practically these models at scale, right? And it always points down to the question of, okay, what's the model's confidence in its output, right? So basically how confident is the model that whatever it outputs is right? Now you can argue that, okay, um, it's always the question about what is the price of getting the answer wrong, right? So you can quantify that and then maybe you say, okay, well, in that case, I accept that there is a certain wrong answer in, I don't know, every thousand cases or every hundred cases. But um, this also is a bit hindering the, the, the trust in this model. And I think particularly if you're dealing with regulators and where you need to explain um, what are the, the the decisions your model has taken, right? And how did that impact your client in whatsoever? This is a problem. So I think really the confidence and this topic of, I think, hallucination, so the technical term for, I don't know, uh, LLMs not always providing the right results is, is very key. And I think mm -hmm. this is one, if not the area of interest research going so, on. 
That's a very interesting topic. I'm like, um, well, let's say it's around the limitations of LLMs and uh, yeah, transparency indeed. and these kind of things. Before we move on to that, because I think we should move on to that. We should discuss that today. I have one mm -hmm. more question about, um, like, let's say, com using the technology of large language models together with the data in your organization. And it's around, um, like, uh, so we, we talked a lot about structured data, text, and uh, knowledge bases, and these kind of things. What about structured data? What about data that is in databases or numbers? Um, how realistic it is that I build a solution that actually gives me correct answers that are that are fact based and and where the, the the answers are actually in the database and a traditional uh, structured mm -hmm. database. Yeah, yeah, That's that actually um, that uh, is that basically points at an approach that was. Uh, that was published um, uh, just in the month after ChatGPT uh, came out in December mm -hmm. last year um, by um, Timo Schick and colleagues from Meta. Uh, he's a former, um, um, he's an alumni from the institute where I studied, um, um, which is why um, uh, I, I looked at this closely. And this is actually one of the best works I've seen on this. And um, they train a language model to use APIs. Uh, several mm -hmm. APIs um, and to decide itself they train it to to make the decision to use an API or not so, okay um, so this is basically an end-to-end -end approach um, mm -hmm. and and that's one of the most promising I've seen so far in this area okay. I expect to people are concentrating a lot of rock because it's really easy to do mm -hmm. you can basically all the components you to, to do that, you can just download and do something within 10 minutes. Uh, it's, it's really straightforward. You don't need any to do any training. Uh, you have lots of, of pipelines ready for that. Um, it's, it's really, really trivial. Uh, whereas uh, something like Tourformer uh, requires tedious uh, data pre-processing and, and training, of course. And uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's very... It's much more cumbersome to do. Mm -hmm. It's much more involved technically, but uh, it is actually much more elegant from a technical point of view. Mm -hmm. And in, in principle, it's much more versatile. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, um, so I actually, I'm still waiting for research to go farther down mm -hmm. that road. I hope, I really hope it will, mm -hmm. um, because I, I thought this to be one of the most um, technically mm -hmm. convincing approaches I've seen so far. Okay. I want to build on, on what you're saying, Pascal, with maybe an example uh, which a bit uh, illustrates um, why web services are also very important in that case. So imagine, I don't know, you you want to come up with the price, right? The price, you say you are going to sell that good or that service to the client, right? And you have a web service which basically does exactly that price calculation and that may contain complex rules but needs simple input. So for instance, your and then we do the reasoning and understand, okay, what are the particular elements about that client, which quite frankly, what is it he or she wants uh, to buy, and then feed that into that web service, which then exact, let's say, returns the right price for that client in whatever constraints there are. Modeling such a pricing engine into an LLM would be something very complex, though, if not even feasible and unclear and mm -hmm. with the web service where you externalize this right you have all the flexibility of having your special rules and discounts and fidelity points and whatsoever and can still use the llm technology basically to feed into that web service you retrieve the information and then you get mm -hmm. one consistent result basically to the to the client so as an example how that could look in mm -hmm. in practice yeah i mean that is basically what current research uh, our current research gives a lot of evidence that um, the approach of um, of basically having uh, breaking down your task in different capabilities and using LLMs where LLMs uh, take the role of solving the linguistic uh, problems, basically, mm -hmm. if you yeah. will, and 
um, doing all the deterministic stuff, the rule-based stuff in another external system. This is where actually research right now gives a lot of evidence that this is uh, mm -hmm. what it will take to actually implement some kind of reasoning, something mm -hmm. that is a lot of talked about. And we see uh, mm -hmm. piling uh, evidence piling up that re LNMs do not reason. They cannot mm -hmm. reason and they cannot by design. Um, this is uh, this is uh, the, the the stance most famously taken probably by by Lucan um, at Meta, mm -hmm. and 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 really uh, research is is pointing in that direction very very clearly. So what LMs are good at is uh, doing linguistic stuff like uh, discovering uh, relations between entities, um, mm -hmm. extracting entities as well, uh, or, or uh, identifying entities. But what it is, and, and, and but what it is not good at is doing deterministic stuff because it's not working deterministically. Right. That's by design. So, and 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 uh, if it if we can combine deterministic systems, calculators, it's a very bad calculator, actually. <laughs> LMs, no matter what size, are <laughs> very do that, very yeah. bad calculators. <laughs> and um, um, and but those those tasks. Um, they have uh, they have rules and they're actually really easy to implement. Which is what we've done <laughs> with computing, right? With classic yes. computing, you don't need LLMs to do that. Uh, the The trick here is to, well, you, you should to ask quite such a question to such a model that the model understands that it shouldn't try to answer it. It should try to get the answer somewhere else. <laughs> and this is where the trick is, isn't it? I. I I'm remembering of two things. One was like a um, uh, Lex Friedman podcast episode with um, Steve Wolfram, where we was talking oh, yeah. about where we was talking about um, translating uh, natural language queries, uh, natural language sentences to some Wolfram language that they that they use, and that that, that language. It's a sort of intermediate language between um, the two. Um, that 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 that's what they were working on, actually. So uh, they do that now, but they were approaching the idea of using um, a large language model actually to do that translation from natural language to Wolfram language, I believe it's called. Mm -hmm. That was one thing, that, one approach that is different from what you mentioned, but it's what they what they say that they're trying and then um another one was from from our last episode our last podcast episode um it was about business intelligence and llms um with tobias uh, swingman and he mentioned an approach around and this was just exploratory conversation around well, making classic bi systems uh, more LLM friendly, mm -hmm. meaning that um, instead of trying to, well, plainly translate a natural language query into a SQL query that makes queries on a complex system, no, creating actual uh, views of the data that are more LLM friendly, where the columns have really explicit names, so that will be much easier for an LLM to translate a natural language query to a database query if the columns are sort of self-explanatory or if you have good metadata explaining what the columns are. Um, so these are approaches that I heard, uh, but I, this is very exciting because there's no one good approach to this. And, and I guess that calling an API would be Something similar. We also need to kind of train the LLM to be able to call an API. You need to document the API properly so that the LLM knows how to build mm -hmm. query to a certain API. Yeah, and when? <laughs> and when? And that's the other. Thing. <laughs> yeah, so, but I let, let's let's move on to the to to the topic. Something that you mentioned already, and my question to both of you is. You can decide who goes who goes first. Is the topic of responsible AI? For example, if you need um, transparency in an answer, if you need to, for instance, to to understand how 
how the model came up with an answer. Can you use an LLM to do that? Or is it, we are not there yet? You want to start? Should I? <laughs> you, you go first. Okay, so um, with this, um, I'm, I must say I'm quite pessimistic. Um, okay. I um, we, there will be advancements, and there are, there have been already in, in, uh, in, in how, how LLMs can be explained or in explainable AI applied to LLMs. Mm -hmm. But I, uh, um, I doubt, or I think what I saw, what I was, what I'm seeing is that we're very, very far from actually. Mm -hmm having useful methods for LMs of the scale that we are seeing today that we're using like in the billion the billion parameter domain billion to hundreds of billion parameters domain right mm -hmm. um, the um, like existing established and well understood uh, mm -hmm. techniques like shapely values you cannot just apply them to LLMs it's too costly so and it's, it's a difficult problem in general, right? So if you want to, if you use a neural network and you want to get the result to be explained, how did the neural, how did the network inf infer this value? Um, it's not easy at all, right? You can, there are some black box approaches that you can try. Mm -hmm. um, but then if you look yeah. inside and try to understand, oh, okay, how did it come up with the answer? It, it's yeah. really not an easy answer. And if you expand that to a billion parameters network, it's essentially impossible. At least not. Yeah. I mean, well, it's, it's also much. Yeah. yeah I think it's also much easier to give an explainability for, for instance, a categorical value, right? Than for giving the explanation of, of the full the full reasoning of, of an LLM. So that's really like the complexity and also dimensionality of of the problem um but maybe there is an intermediate step and we spoke about it before right so in the case of rack applications you know having at least the reference to that particular document right in the rack case is already something right because the llm will tell you okay this was the place which made me i don't know provide you this or that information right so it's not exactly what you described, but it's maybe an intermediate step, which may satisfy, let's say, the same the same needs or at least the same, um, mm -hmm. let's say, starting point where we are more exploring this technology and also where research is is gonna go in into that direction. But in general, I'm, I mean, I'm siding with Pascal, so this is very complex complex thing to do. So if if a client if a client or if somebody asks us. Can I use LLMs in an environment where I have to explain the output of the model? The answer is I cannot. Or what is the Correct. answer? <laughs> I cannot yet. Or I, no. I need to. I need to. To what? What can we do? No, I would really go for uh, no. We cannot, and we will not for a foreseeable future, okay. if at all. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. I'm actually pessimistic that we can do this at all. It's um, with LLMs. Right? Yeah, with LLMs. Um, I, I I see the the question for ex or the the urgency for ex for explainability in LLMs comes originates, I think, a lot from um people wanting to use or, or the temptation to use LLMs in environments where you just shouldn't use them um okay <laughs> very um, good point in, per in particular I tend to where, agree. where mm -hmm. decisions uh where it, it where LLMs take over the position of humans as decision makers or as deterministic systems that have been tested thoroughly um right um those are not use cases for an LLM is my my opinion mm -hmm. um and they and I don't think that they will be for the foreseeable future right mm -hmm. um maybe that, that that's a good thing to to reflect on right so I know this episode is called uh, or is about large language models right and it's a very hot topic uh gen AI in general but uh, we need to be clear about one thing is that LLMs are one additional thing in the toolbox, right? And really, it depends on the problem and in the domain you have this problem, right? If LLMs are the right solution or not. So these are so, exactly a bit kind of like the limitations of, of LLMs. So, 
Yeah. I, so uh, aren't LLMs the solution for everything? <laughs> <laughs> I, I wouldn't say so. So it's it's going to be an evolution, right? And uh, I think uh, sometimes simple methods, and I don't know if it's just a regular expression, could be much more powerful than using an LLM. Also looking at I don't know trade off costs, etc. So it's uh, I think there's a saying: a fool with a tool is still a fool, right? So um, think wisely about where to where to use this kind of technology mm -hmm. where it makes sense. It's very very powerful, but it has its limitations. So it makes sense to use it where you don't need, where you don't need uh, determinism. So if you don't yeah. expect, or, uh, don't expect deterministic things, you you can use it. Um, where else can you use it? So uh, or or we could turn it around. Where where else should you not use it? So when you need deterministic things, when you need, um, when you are thinking of or considering replacing human decision making with llm decision making that's not a good idea either whenever you need transparency in uh, or ex uh, explainability in in the outcome um yeah. so these are places where you shouldn't use it um uh so what about hallucinations right now sometimes this um the, the, the fact that answers from llms are extremely plausible and uh, but it can be complete nonsense uh but they sound great and they are many times very plausible what is what so what is it that we need to think about when uh when we we know that lms hallucinate can be manipulated into hallucinating mm -hmm. into making up things so when we should consider seriously consider not using them because of this. Actually, we sh we should not consider them in many many cases. I would <laughs> rather I personally would rather go as a computational linguist with with what they could be should be used. Uh, yeah. Let's just give an example. Uh, um, I think what stri or I can I can argue from a, from the perspective of a computational linguist um, and. Um, and what was really striking for the field, for the scientific field, uh, when JetGPT or when JetGPT came out, when GPT, the GPT models came, but especially with JetGPT. Um, so the moment basically for science, the JetGPT moment was, okay, linguistic problems have been solved. We were not, it was not deemed possible five years ago, mm -hmm. or we were it was deemed very improbable, not impossible, but very improbable that we would have a system by 23 um, that would be capable of producing consistently correct linguistic output, linguistic form, right? Mm -hmm. Typically would say linguistic form. We're not talking about the meaning, but about the form, yeah. right? That it's consistently grammatically correct. Um, that is a problem that we have been grappling with forever until then. And, mm -hmm. um, and this, is, this is basically solved. This is one of the only things, in all honesty, that are, can be considered solved. The problems behind meaning, the, the compositionality of meaning and uh, reasoning, um, all these things, they're by no means solved, right? This is very obvious. Mm -hmm. um, and motivates all the thinking about what it should not be used about. But um, but um, the linguistic capabilities that extend across multiple languages, you can train one model with data sets in different languages and have and re this results in a multilingual model. This is really fascinating. That's really and, big, yeah. And that's, uh, uh, that's a really, really uh, offers a lot of potential. So what I would argue what we should use them for is linguistic tasks, right? Um, um, so have it one component, one, uh, ver the a very powerful linguistic component in mm -hmm. the pipeline of, of, of systems in a, in a, in a complex of systems, mm -hmm. um, have it process language and have it output language, um, but not conf don't confuse it for a reasoning, uh, system. All right. So, um, we are we are getting close to the end of our episode. Um, uh, question to Mark. Mark, 
What do you see in terms of, given what we said today, and um, and in your area of, of most of where you have the most experience, for example, in insurance, mm -hmm. um, where do you see the, the impact in the next six months of this kind of technology? Yeah. So I see definitely now that people are basically applying it, right? I think if I would recommend one thing is really the reflection on what's the right model for the task you want to do, right? So looking at insurance, it completely differs if you want to facilitate contract writing or, uh, I don't know, using complex underwriting standards to come up with a certain, I don't know, um, decision or if you want to do claim handling. So for this, choose the right LLMs, right? So. I believe it will continue the emergence of more open source models. I think embracing open source is probably the way to go because mm -hmm. there is just so much evolution in that. Uh, mm -hmm. And it has the very nice thing that you can also do it in your data center, maybe in your on your mobile and devices. So maybe that's not for the next six months, but there is a bit where the, the future is going to. Um, see I think it's, yeah. Do you see uh, it's, it's, fine tuning? How much fine tuning will there be, for example, in insurance? Do you think there's going to be a lot of in, yep. uh, insurance fine tuned models, or is I, I, I see it maybe as a multi layered approach? So maybe you start with your base model, which is not fine tuned, but then you can think about an industry specific, a generic mm -hmm. insurance model or reinsurance model with knowledge all of that industry. So maybe there the training would be, I don't know, books about that domain, right? Or let's say general public information. Mm -hmm. And then the next layer is your RAC application, so right? Enhancing it with your particular documents from your company, which are specific to your particular case. And that mm -hmm. is then basically enhancing it. So it's like multi-layers and I see emergence of that. Um, the question is, will there be, I don't know, these models in, in, in the open source space or will there commercial models emerging for, let's say, industry specifics. I think that has to be seen, but it's definitely one way to, I don't know, make mm -hmm. use of general public information, but with industry focus and still making use of your documents. So, and I think uh, many companies are starting to reflect about this and how to make use of that within their processes. And I think that's the, the right way to go and make use of this uh, powerful tech. Mm -hmm. Pascal, what do you see happening in the next six months? Do you also think or think that we'll have um, like uh, like industry specific fine tuned models or um, more or task oriented, more language, more industry specific? And what else do you think is going to happen? Yeah, I I, I really think that uh, um, that the RAG approach is one of the best uh, one of the most robust uh, ways to go actually mm -hmm. um i but i at the same time i expect a fine tuning to, to become cheaper and cheaper we already saw uh, an enormous progress in the last year um mm -hmm. with um with um, um especially with like with in, with quantization making basically making them smaller, making them very efficiently in, in a very efficient way, um, being able to run billion parameter models on your laptop, mm -hmm. um, but also fine tuning techniques that have been around for a while, like LoRa, uh, really have taken off, are integrated in, um, in, in, in common libraries uh, that are used everywhere. Uh, so all of this has become really easy now. And I, I expect it to become easier even more. And in particular, I expect models to become smaller and smaller. Right now, basically, the uh, the, the smallest, uh, the most common from the common, most common uh, model families, the smallest is seven billion parameters. I expect models to become smaller, mm -hmm. and, uh, and and I expect them to become more specialized um, mm -hmm. because um, this is really uh, end uh, to leverage uh, pre-training, mm -hmm. distill, compress. Uh, and then uh, fine tune, specialize, uh, which will enable uh, having stuff run on your local working machine or even on your your smartphone. Um, I really expect that to be taking off. And, and this is the next six months. Year, you think that this is going? This is the time scale. 
at the given speed, yeah. Uh, the, the next, well, everything of this is, is uh, I don't know. It will have. <laughs> it will continuously happen. It will just the, the development will not stop right now. Uh, mm. With the small, with the smaller models, I would totally change my judgment for the bigger models. Actually, uh, I mean, this might be a hot take, but um, I. I I do not foresee such a bright future for those huge models that are used right now, mm-hmm. because um, because they're so resource intensive. Too um, expensive. This will, yeah, this will become harder and harder to justify, and to build business models around. This is a very mm-hmm. hot take. I know I'm aware of that, but um, mm-hmm. um, but this would be my my guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I want to add one thing. This is also why I think you should really keep an eye on niche players, which are maybe now not relevant startups acting in this space, right? Because uh, there is less and less uh, reliance on, I don't know, huge GPU. I mean, it's still, um, let's say, necessary, right? But but as you're saying, so as the models get smaller, that gets a bit, uh, let's say, opened up. Also, uh, infrastructure Mm -hmm. is getting cheaper, so that is going to open up for new use cases also, and uh, de- definitely an interesting space to look into with a lot of movement in the, in the weeks and months to come. So, uh, like um, companies that, to you, you talk about niche players, you're talking about um, companies that focus on uh, serving customers that have some niche needs, uh, like uh, data privacy and, and, and these kind of things. Exactly, data privacy, security, uh, en- encryption of models. So uh, uh, I recently read about homomorphic encryption also in, in, in use cases around LLMs. So there's going to be an emergence mm-hmm. of, let's say, m- more niche, more specialized kind of LLMs for particular needs in particular industries. Uh, now that basically, say, the first layer has been, mm-hmm. has been done, there's a stable foundation. Now there's going to be more more specialization, and, and that's what I meant, yeah. All right. Um, so we are uh, we are just getting to the end of our episode. Thank you for um, for being here today. Uh, thank you, Pascal, to, to jo- for joining us today. Um, Pleasure. It was a great conversation. Uh, I think we could be. Uh, I think we could continue for hours. Uh, but unfortunately, we are we don't have unlimited time. Uh, so uh, you thank you for thank you for watching. Um, if you are watching us on YouTube, please give us a, a like and subscribe our YouTube channel. Uh, you can also listen to this episode on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. So uh, I hope you enjoyed the conversation today, and I hope to see you again next time. Thank you, everyone. This was fun. Thank you, it was a pleasure.